Well, good morning, everybody. How are we all doing this morning? Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. Um, so, as you heard this morning, Sydney made the announcement about trunk or treat, and um, I believe she is correct. I think we have lots of volunteers. I might be mistaken, though. Do we have enough trunks? Can anybody confirm or deny what I'm saying is real or true? Um, I do believe, um, I strongly believe, actually, that we might need some more trunks, and that really is what makes the event spectacular. If you've never been before, we park a whole bunch of cars sort of in a line. We open up the trunks. We get creative with the trunks. Um, I might do one this year. I might be Tom Cruise from Top Gun Maverick this year, turn my car into a fighter jet. We don't know. We will see. Um, but if you want to have just a ton of fun, uh, then sign up and uh, let's get a whole bunch of cars out there, a whole bunch of trunks. Just an awesome time for families to come out. And uh, I was reminded by somebody that there's this cool breeze that comes off of that lake. Hallelujah. Just like God's air conditioning unit, just sort of cooling all of us. So that is absolutely fantastic. All righty. So we are in our series. And I want to start off by telling you about a little conversation I had with my kids this week. We were driving in the car, I believe we were on our way to school, and a conversation popped up about a conversation that was had at youth on Wednesday night. Little shout out for all of you parents of teenagers, we have youth on Wednesday nights. But anyways, we were talking about a question that was asked during small group time, and the question was, if you could go back in time, what would you go do, and where would you go? So my 16-year-old daughter, Vanessa, answered first, and she said she would go and get her bag up. Um, this is slang for she would go and make lots of money based upon the knowledge she has of the future. And then she took a photo like this eh, on her phone. Um, so that's what my 16-year-old said. I said that was very enlightening. Thank you very much. Uh, I then shifted to my 12-year-old, Victoria, and I said to her, what would you do? And little Vicky said, if I could go back in time, I would go back to when you and mommy were small and little and my age, and I would want to be your friends. I mean, how sweet. Man, I want to tell you something. They are so cute until they ain't no more cute, right? And 12 is about the cutoff, so we are enjoying, <laughs> we are enjoying the last final years before she turns into, ah. Eh. Okay, so, so they then said to me, Dad, what would you do if you can go back in time? And honestly, without sort of thinking about it at all, it sort of it came out of my mouth. And as it came out of my mouth, I was like, wow, that was kind of profound. And I didn't know I was going to say that, but actually I'm going to stick to that. That's good. I said, if I could go back in time, I would go back to the beginning of my life and I would live it again, but I would do it without fear. And my kids were like, okay, you're just trying to be all pastory. I mean, that sounds, that sounds deep, but you don't seem to be a guy that is really afraid of anything. So what are you, what are you saying? What do you mean by that? Um, and maybe before all of you judge me around what it means to be fearful, I want you to show, some, I want you to show something uh, yeah, this morning. I think if I were to ask you, are you afraid or are you living in fear? I think a lot of us probably would say, some of us would say yes, but I think a lot of us would say no. We don't live in a constant state of fear. But what's interesting is, is I feel like if I asked you the question, are you living in a state of stress? I think a lot of you would go, oh, hallelujah, pastor. Yeah, it's stressful out there. Let me, let me read for you quickly what the internet defines stress as. It used to be the dictionary, now it's Google. Um, this is what it says, stress is how we react when we feel under pressure or threatened. It usually happens when we are in a situation that we don't feel we can manage or control. So that is what the definition of stress is. As I read this definition of stress in the week, there were sort of three words that I associated with the statement. Stress essentially is being anxious. Stress is feeling threatened. 
and stress is feeling helpless. I believe that those three words pretty accurately describes what feeling stressed is. So let's go to the wheel, the fortune of truth. Dun, 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 dun. Um, and I want you to look at afraid. And as we look at afraid there, we find all those same words that essentially describe what it means to be stressed. Um, there we have the word anxious, worried, and nervous. There at the edges, we have the, literally the word threatened. When you feel afraid, you feel threatened. And then that big word helpless um, is another feeling we have. So I would, I would make the argument this morning that as much as many of us maybe don't feel like we are living in a constant state of fear, I believe that many of us are actually experiencing fear in a deeper way more than we would like to admit. And when I think about my own life, and I think about the way I live my life, I do believe that there is this underlying, it's there, right? It's just deep, it's down, it's dark. Um, you've taken it and you've just shoved it deep into a closet somewhere, but just sort of on the, the just deep down there, there's this feeling of fear and anxiety that sort of is always there. So obviously you've guessed it, this morning we are gonna be talking about fear specifically and all things related to fear. So the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to discuss good fear or healthy fear, and then we will go into what unhealthy fear looks like. So I've got a couple of things I'd like to show you. The following things are all healthy fears. First one, picture of a spider. That is a healthy fear. They are vicious, they are evil, they are demonic. Yes, fearful. Next one, heights. Um, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I'm, genuinely getting, I'm genuinely getting dizzy even looking at that picture. Um, there's a movie, uh, there's a documentary that you should or shouldn't watch, I'm not sure, but it's about this guy that did a free climb um, in the Yosemite Park in California. He did it without ropes. I'm telling you right now, I watched this thing with my kids. There were literally moments where I thought I was going to throw up as I was watching it. I mean, it is just, it is devastating. So that is a healthy fear. Next one. Yes. 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 They are scary beasts, are they not? Don't you love how every year, though, at Shark Week, they give you these statistics? More people died having a smoothie at Java Juice than of sharks. Yes, but did the smoothie annihilate them completely? I don't think so. Um, let's move on. This is my greatest fear, ladies and gentlemen. Elevators are evil. They are death machines. They are literally mouths that just want to eat you and consume you. I actually went to a building with Amanda the other day. My eldest daughter, we had to go do something, and they told us that we had all, they'd go all the way to the top of the north wing. We went. I almost had a panic attack. It was one of those old elevators where you get to the floor, and then it takes one Mississippi, two Mississippi, like a thousand Mississippis, and it goes, and it opens up. I'm like, ah. So it was the wrong floor. We had to go down again. Then they told us to go all the way to the top at the west wing. That was even worse. Then we went down again. And where we actually had to go was right next to the receptionist on ground floor. And then I almost had a heart attack. So that's a healthy fear. Um, next one, teenagers are scary. I'm just going to be real with you all. <laughs> Flee, run, uh, don't go near them. Um, just put a fence around them, give it a little bit of time, five years, they'll be back, but just run for the hills. And then my most recent fear, just board meetings. Um, church board meetings scare me a lot. So just board meetings in general can be scary, but these are all things that are completely natural to be afraid of. We should have fear when it comes to things that threaten our lives. Um, it is a safety mechanism. It is a healthy thing. You will feel your sort of heart uh, racing a little bit. You'll feel adrenaline. I had a buddy in high school that was not afraid of anything. That led him all the way to a moment where he decided to pee on an electric fence. And uh, then he started becoming a little bit more fearful in his life. But fear is a good thing, and it can actually save your life. But there is a different kind of a fear that I want to look at today 
and that fear is not necessarily a fear in the moment based upon specific things that threaten our lives. That fear is more the fear that I've been talking about earlier. It's this underlying, how can I call this? It's almost like a spirit of fear that really just sort of follows you around. So come with me to 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 to 8. This is a beautiful portion of Scripture. Uh, Paul, the apostle, is speaking to Timothy. uh, And really what Paul is trying to do is, is he's trying to motivate Timothy. Paul is speaking to the very thing that drives, motivates, and moves Timothy. He appeals to his motivation, and listen to what he's saying here. He says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, listen to this, not, God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. So Paul is crying out to Timothy, and he's saying to him, listen, you've got a calling in your life. You've got gifts in your life. God has things for you, but you cannot live your life in fear. You cannot allow fear to be the thing that dictates or drives your decision making. And Paul then goes on to say that the spirit we have been given has not a spirit of fear. Now, we do know that God has given us the spirit. God has given us his Holy Spirit. And in this verse, it tells us that the Holy Spirit is filled with power. It is filled with love. Um, The Holy Spirit will give us a sound mind. So that is what the Holy Spirit gives us. So what I love about this portion of Scripture here is, is really what Paul is saying is, is the life you are living in fear is not a godly life. And there will be times where I will try to justify my own fears. Um, in In my moments where I feel anxious, in my moments when I feel stressed out, in my moments when I feel like it's all too much, sometimes the inner conversation I will have with myself is, but of course you feel stressed out. Of course you feel like there's a lot going on. You've got lots of responsibility on your life. I was telling the kids um, this week that I think what I might wear for Halloween this year is just a T-shirt that says responsibility on it. (laughs) Grown-up fears. (laughs) Bills, taxes, responsibilities. Um, But uh, in those moments, I will often try to tell myself, it's okay that you're feeling this way. You're justified because life is stressful. But the Apostle Paul is saying to us is, no, but that's not how we're called to live. We're not called to live in that state of fear. We are called to lean into the spirit that God has given us. And in that spirit, we will find peace and joy and power and rest and love. So it is not normal for us as Christians to be living in a constant state of fear. What I'd like to do as we move on here this morning is I'd like to look at some of the fears that I have in my own personal life. I believe these are fears that sort of affect all of us. And this is really what I was referring to a little earlier when I said, when my kids asked me, what would I do different in my life? I said I would go back and I would live my life without fear. The more I pondered it and the more I thought about it, the more I realize that the three fears I'm going to throw out at you this morning have essentially been a part of my life for as long as I can remember, and it just, it's just sort of there, and it affects things in a very subtle way without you even realizing it. So we're going to look at those three fears, and then what we're going to do is, is I'm going to give you some scripture. I'm going to give you some weapons this morning to combat these fears. So the first one, that I believe a lot of us live under is the fear of failure. Just the fear of failure. And on the surface level, it doesn't feel like it's that deep, Um, but I do think it goes a lot deeper than just all that. Um, When I think about failing, I think what makes it bad for me or what makes it big for me is the fact that somewhere in my life, I have told myself 
that what I do and what I accomplish directly influences who I am and what I am worth, right? It's not just so much that we are afraid of failing at something. I think what we are really afraid of is we are afraid of being worthless. We are afraid of being failures as people. And I think the culture we live in really feeds into that. Um, We really live in a culture where success is sort of thrown out there. We are given pictures of what success looks like all the time. And then we are told that if you have these things or if you do these things, you will be a successful person. So when you don't measure up, it actually starts to feel like you're failing as a person. And that is a heavy thing to walk around with um, in your life. It is a very heavy thing. The thing that makes it even worse is we've decided to take all our deepest anxious thoughts and anxieties and we've put it on the TV. Uh, I'm calling it the TV, but it's the World Wide Web. Um, We're all the stars of our own reality shows now. We've decided to put that pressure on ourselves. So now, not only do you have this pressure of not feeling like you're a failure, but you've got the pressure of living it out in real time on air for the world to see. (laughs) No wonder we're feeling anxious and we're feeling a little stressed out. I believe that if you are living in this space where you are afraid of failure or you are afraid of being a failure, it's going to live itself out in your life in one of two ways. One of two things will become the thing that you're living under. The first one is we will adopt the attitude in life that if we don't ever really try, then we won't ever really fail. Man, I will tell you what, I have seen a lot of this in my life. There's just this attitude of, if I don't ever really put myself out there, then I won't ever really fail, therefore I am not really a failure. The problem with that is, is that you can't live that way forever. Eventually, you will shift to a place where you are feeling disappointed and you, are feel, and you will start to feel resentful because you're not actually living the life that God has called you to live. I remember years ago when I still lived in South Africa, I remember seeing an interview with, uh, with a lady that won Miss South Africa. She won the Miss South Africa pageant. She was, uh, she was obviously very beautiful, and they were interviewing her, and they said to her, you know, what was it like growing up in your school and all the rest of it? And she told this story, which I thought was remarkable. She said that in high school, she hardly had any friends, and she said that she never went on a date at any point, um, so much so that she went to her matric dance or her prom, uh, her prom night, whatever you want to call it, by herself because nobody actually asked her out ever at any point, right? And as I looked at this, I realized that nobody wanted to be rejected. (laughs) Nobody, everybody thought, man, it's out of my league. I'm just not going to go for it. I'm not going to ask the question. And that is what happens. We essentially get to this place where we go, I will rather never try anything than live a life of disappointment. Second thing that will start to manifest itself in your life is we will adopt the attitude in life that nothing is more important than winning, or rather nothing is more important than being perfect. You are just going to run yourself into the ground. Please believe me. It's the Pinterest lifestyle, right, where we get ourselves into this place where we can't do a thing, no matter how simple it is, without it becoming a whole production, because we are constantly chasing this idea, this dream, this image of perfection. I'm telling you right now, it's not sustainable, and eventually you're going to find yourself in a place where you get very tired and very burnt out. Those are the things that will happen if you're afraid of failure. So what is the remedy to all of this? Come with me to Galatians 3, 23 to 29. Again, it's Paul speaking, and he says this, Um, He says, before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. I want to pause there just for a second, and I want to remind you about what he's saying here. When Paul says, 
We were in custody. We were prisoners. We were locked up under the law. Paul is referring to the Old Testament covenant. And the covenant in the Old Testament we had with God was very simply this. God would be faithful to us if we were faithful back to him. Remember the Ten Commandments. So God says, I will love you, I will protect you, I will be your God, I will be with you. What I'm asking in return is you have no other gods before you. Um, There's a whole list of things that you need to do. Really, what I want to say to you this morning is a different way of looking at the law is to see it as a performance-driven religion. It was very much based on performance. It was very much based on what you did and what you did not do, which is not very dissimilar to the life some of us are living. Because some of us have made a covenant with ourselves where we've gone, me being a person of value is determined on what I do and what I don't do. So some of us are living in a covenant of law that we've made with ourselves. Do you see that this morning? That covenant will actually hold you custody. Listen to what Paul goes on to say here. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, right? There's a new covenant. So listen to this. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is, neither is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you, listen to this, belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is absolutely gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful. And I love how Paul says, listen, you were once prisoners to performance, is really what he's saying. There was a time where you were a prisoner to your performance, but you as Christians do not live under that anymore. Why? Because your life is no longer determined by your performance, but your life is determined by your faith in Christ what makes you valuable, what makes you precious, what makes you significant is not what you do and what you don't do, but it's the fact that you belong to Jesus Christ. We belong to Him through faith. It is a beautiful thing. So this morning, I want to encourage you, when you find yourself in those moments where you're afraid of failure and you're afraid of what it means for you, I want you to remember, I want you to recognize that you being loved, you being significant is not about you trying something and failing. It's not what it's about. It's about your faith in Christ. I want to read you another, another little scripture here. I, man, I, 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 was, I was thinking about it as I put the scripture in the sermon this week. This will be like, you know, how your Apple playlist will give you the top songs that you listen to. I think if we did that at the end of the year with scriptures, this one would pop up. We've read this a lot this year. Uh, 1 John 2 verse 1, but it is just so good. Uh, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Sin is not what God has for us. Failure is not what God desires for us. But if you do, because you will, (laughs) is what the scripture is saying. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So really what I want you to see here this morning is, is first and foremost, understand that you are not defined by what you do and what you don't do. I know that's what the world will tell you. I know that's what we believe. But your significance, your worthiness, your value is found in your relationship with Christ. That is where it is found. And then secondly, I want you to know that when you try things and they don't work out, it's not the end of your life and it's not the end of your calling because we have a Savior that gives us mercy and grace and forgiveness. We have a safety net essentially because of the gospel. And what that should do is is that should empower you to no longer live a life where you never try anything. You know, I remember for the longest time in my life, even my view of God's calling on my life was this, and this is the best way I can describe it. It's almost like I had this picture of this big canyon, 
and there was this tiny little rope that sort of extended over the canyon. And it was my job, if I was going to follow God in my life, if I was going to live out God's calling, it was my job to essentially take steps of faith over this canyon and try to balance on this little wire. Let me tell you right now, I've got the balance of a rhinoceros. Um, It's never going to work. I am going to fall. And, you know, the end result of my life was I would look out at these moments, these canyon moments. I would look out at these moments in my life, and I would go, there's no ways I can balance that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to stand at the edge. I'm just going to be a tourist in my own life. I'm just going to look at the canyon for five minutes, and then I'm going to move on. But what grace does, what mercy does, is it puts a net at the bottom, and it says, hey, even when you fall, even when you stumble, I've got you in the palm of my hand, and I will get you, my child, to where it is I'm calling you to go. Are you with me this morning? So that's how we deal with that. Next one I want to talk about, and this is my biggest one probably, it's elevators, and then this one. Um, If you have fear, there's a good chance that you have the fear of man in your life. Some of us have the fear of failure. Some of us have the fear of man. Um, One of the phrases I hear a lot just in our culture is social anxiety. (laughs) You've heard this being said a lot, right? People will say often and a lot, um, I've got social anxiety. That is not a term I heard a lot back in the 90s, but now you hear it very often. But really, let's get real about this. When you speak about social anxiety, really what you're speaking about is a fear of man. It is a fear of people. And this fear can take the form of a lot of things. Um, It can be a fear of being hurt because you have been hurt in your life. I think we can all agree at some point in our lives, somebody has disappointed us. Um, That fear can be the fear of disappointing others. Um, That can be a very real fear in your life as well. But really, under the surface, in the underlying area of your life, there is this constant thing that's driving your decisions, and very often it is this fear of man. So I believe, again, that this will manifest itself in a couple of different ways if this is what you're dealing with. Um, The first one is this. If you have a fear of man, there is a danger that you will become a complete walkover in your life. You just become a uh, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Um, you just say yes to everything. Uh, you don't ever push back on anything. Uh, you are just the nicest, sweetest. You're that sweet tea that you get at Cracker Barrel. It's so sweet. It's just sweet, right? <laughs> you are that sweet. Um, and essentially what's happening now is, is you allow everybody just to take a big fat waltz over your life And you've adopted this attitude of, well, it's not great, it's not awesome, but at least there's no friction, at least I'm not hurting anybody, at least I'm not doing anything to harm anybody else. Here is the thing that I want to tell you, and and this is going to be terrible. Um, You're actually harming yourself, number one, and number two, people still don't like you. (laughs) Ah, what? (laughs) Yes, because some people aren't going to like you no matter what you do. Because that's just how it is, right? So the reality is, is this. Nobody can be put in a position where they are essentially ruled um, forever. It just doesn't work that way. If, if there is an oppression that is taking place, there is a rebellion that will rise up. When you live your life in this attitude that I'm just going to be a walkover, the inner you, the self, you, You are essentially creating a system where the real you is being oppressed, and it will only be a matter of time before the real you starts a rebellion. And that is when you're going to start feeling all kinds of feelings, one of them being, let's go back to last week, ding, 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 anger. You're going to start feeling angry with yourself. Next one, if you have a fear of man, it is very possible that uh, you can become a person that is just a walkover. The next one is you will become an emotional control freak. (laughs) Um, and, And this is where I need to be very, very open with you and very honest with you. This is something that I have massively, um, in the last, I would say, two years since um, 
you know, kind of becoming the leader of this church since getting into a place where I've got a lot of responsibilities, a lot of leadership decisions need to be made, leadership changes, COVID, buildings, all these things. You get put in a position where you have to make decisions. And I never knew this about myself, but I want to please everybody. I know you can't believe that because of how few times I actually please you, but I actually do have a desire on the inside to be a person that pleases, or let me be more accurate, I have a desire to be a person that never offends or never causes you discomfort emotionally. And what I call that is, I don't even know if there's a real term for this, I call that being an emotional control freak. Now, here's the problem with all of this. It masquerades as compassion. That's what it does. Um, you start to live your life in such a way where every decision you make, you're thinking, how's this person going to feel? How's that person going to feel? How's this person going to feel? I know what the right thing is to do. That's not actually the battle I'm fighting here. The battle I'm fighting is, is how do I say it? How do I do it? How do I keep everybody emotionally in a place where they're happy? And the lie you tell yourself is that it's because of compassion. You go, you know, I'm carrying this burden because I'm just the most compassionate person in the world. That's why. I care about people. The reality is, is that you are an insecure narcissist. That's what you are. Um, you're insecure because you need other people's approval to flourish. That's number one. And you're a narcissist because you actually believe and think you have the power to control other people's well-being. Who do you think you are? And by you, I mean me, talking to myself. Um, this is something that will absolutely hamstring you. It is something that will tire you out. Um, it is something that will put you in a place where you cannot function the way you need to function. Um, when you look at Jesus in the Gospels, what is incredible is Jesus has this way, and we know he's the most compassionate person that's ever lived. We know he's the most loving person that's ever lived. But have you noticed that Jesus does not necessarily try to manage other people's emotions? When he calls the Pharisees whitewashed tombs and a brood of vipers, he's not going, I wonder if Pharisee 3 is going to be offended by this. He goes, here is the truth. I'll die for your sins later, but here's the truth of the situation. And that is really where we need to get to. I, um, I have gone and I have been in a couple of therapy sessions myself over the last couple of months, and uh, it's been extremely helpful and it's been extremely awesome. Part of the reason I tell you that is because I want you to know that nobody is beyond help. Nobody is at a place where they should not go seek help if they need it. I want to encourage you to do the same if you need it. But I remember after one of my sessions, the, uh, the therapist said to me, He's like, so, and I can't remember exactly what he asked me, but he asked me something to the tune of, was the session helpful, or do you feel like there's a breakthrough or something? And I smiled at him, and I said, yes, that was amazing. That was such a good session. I, I can't explain to you how life-changing that session was. And I walked out to the car, and I was like, that was the worst session I've ever had. I actually think I've gone backwards. I think I'm worse now than I was before. And as I was walking to the car, I go, so now I'm lying to the therapist. Why, why would I do that? Why am I lying to the therapist? And then I realized that I told him the session was good because I did not want to hurt his feelings. So now I'm trying to emotionally manipulate my therapist. Pray for me in Jesus' name. Last one. I want to look at you. Uh, the way these things will work themselves out in your life is the last one is just a very simple one, but this is not going to work for you. Um, you simply just completely cut people out and you become isolated. That's it. That's the simple one. People are difficult. People are complicated. People are rude. People are mean. I hurt them. They hurt me. I'm just going to become a caveman, move up into the mountains. See ya. Um, that's what I'm going to do. But again, this is not going to work. And if you do that, just mark my words, the feeling is going to move from afraid to sad. You're going to become sad if you isolate yourself. Why? Because again, the inner self is designed. It is made for connection. You crave it. You need it. So if you live your life that way, it's not going to be good. Come with me to Jeremiah 1, 4 to 10. 
And this is, um, and, I, and again, I'm trying to give you the, what's the solution to this fear of man? And this is an amazing portion of Scripture. This is actually when God calls Jeremiah into his calling. And listen to what he says here. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, this is Jeremiah, I don't know how to speak and I'm too young. <laughs> don't you love how he's literally speaking when he says, I don't know how to speak, right? Interesting. Uh, he's definitely a teenager, I can tell you that. Uh, but the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them. Hey, I'm telling you this morning, do not be afraid of them. Why? For I am with you, says the Lord, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appointed you over the nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. I don't think there is another job in the history of the world that is a more triggering social anxiety job than prophet in the Old Testament. <laughs> your job is to be a public speaker and as a public speaker, you're not a stand-up comic. It is your job, essentially, to go to churches like this and to go, here's the list of things you're not doing well. And if you don't change immediately, there will be repercussions, right? It's a confrontational, in-your-face, upfront public ministry. Nothing about this is easy. Nothing about this is calm. But the Lord says this to Jeremiah, and he says it over and over in that verse. He says, I formed you. I knew you. God is saying to Jeremiah, I know you. I am in relationship with you. You belong to me, and I belong to you. He then goes on to say, listen, don't be afraid of their faces, and you're going to see some scary faces, but don't be afraid of it, because I am with you. I want to tell you this morning that the fear of man has less to do with men and it has more to do with your relationship with the Lord. It is your relationship with the Lord. It is that understanding that you belong to Him. He loves you. He values you. He is with you. And as long as you understand that, as long as you live in that place, you have the confidence to do what you need to do in your life. Don't get to a place where you give all that power to everybody else, but be in a place where you go, as long as God is for me, and as long as I am for Him, I need not fear anybody else because He is the only one that matters. It is really beautiful. Last thing I want to look at you is uh, fear of the future. <sighs> fear of failure, fear of people, fear of the future. Um, this one is getting worse and worse for me the older I am getting, and, and the fears are just becoming more and more irrational. Um, and, and I will put into this category just every weird kind of fear that there is. I fear that there's going to be another hurricane and a gator is going to wash up uh, in my living room. Um, I fear that I will, you know, get to a place where I can't eat red meat anymore. I fear, I fear, I fear, I fear, I fear for the country. I fear about politics. I, I saw a thing online about a dog being abused in Uganda, and I'm just up at night thinking about this poor dog. What if my dog went through it? You're just fearful. You're fearful. You're fearful. You're fearful. It's all the things that could be and should be. It's not even necessarily rooted in anything solid. You're just living in this constant state of panic and exhaustion about all the things that could be. Um, we looked at our friend Jeremiah, so I want to look at him again, and you know this one so well, um, but Jeremiah 29, 11, every once in a while the prophets get to say something that's just got such good news, but he speaks this over Israel while Israel is in captivity, while they're going through a really rough time. He says, and this is from the Lord, he says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. You might not know the plans that he has for you. 
As a matter of fact, you're probably paralyzed by speculating all day long about what the plan might be. But God is not confused about the plans for your life. He knows the plans for your life. And then he says this, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're thinking, well, I hear what you're saying, but I've gone through some pretty rough times in my life. So what are you talking about? When you say that God knows the outcome, what are you actually saying? And really what I'm saying to you is, is that He knows the end result. He knows the outcome. I, um, I said to Victoria the other night, I wanted to show her a movie. It's a, it's a movie about a, a wolf and a little puppy wolf, and then the mommy dies, and then the puppy wolf finds a friend, uh, a companion, a human. It's a movie called White Fang. It's a million years old. Um, I see myself as the guy, and I always thought I would have a wolf, and now I sort of think that my German Shepherd is my wolf. So I'm just sort of putting myself in this movie. Um, in any case, so we start watching this movie, and Mommy Wolf dies, and it's the best acting by Puppy Wolf I've ever seen in a film. I mean, this, this little dog is running on the beach by himself, and he's crying, and he's writing poetry, and he's going through agony. The music starts playing all by myself. You know, it's just, it's awful. Victoria starts crying in this movie. I'm talking, <laughs> I mean, hysterical. I mean, she is like, ah! Ah! I mean, she's like gripping the couch, and she's like, she takes her little glasses off, and she looks at me with this red face. She's like, how, how could you? I trusted you. What is this? What is this? <laughs> I mean, she's annoyed at me because I told her to watch this movie. And I'm like, okay, listen to me. Like, listen to me. Just put down the knife. Listen to me. Um, <laughs> I've seen the movie. I know how it ends. And it's an absolute bop. It's awesome. It's a, you're going to love this movie. I know the end. So just hang in there with me, please. I know how it's going to end. I know this is terrible. But just hang in there with me. And I want to tell you this morning that God knows the end. He's seen the end of the movie. He knows how it ends. And maybe right now you've been separated from your mama wolf and things are tough in the snowy Alps of Alaska. But I want to tell you, he knows the outcome and he knows what's going to happen. 1 John 4, 16 to 19. And so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In other words, the last day when the movie ends, the final chapter at the end of all of the misery, at the end of all of it, when there is judgment, it is in that place, in this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. And we are told here that, man, we do not need to fear. We do not need to fear punishment. We do not need to fear judgment. Because of what Jesus did, God knows the end of your story. And yes, you might be in the middle of some stuff right now, but he knows the end and he loves you and he cares about you and he's gonna get you to where you need to go. It's not about us having all the answers, but it's about trusting in the fact that the one who does loves us and cares for us. I wanna say one more thing this morning and then we're gonna close. Um, one last little bit of just practical advice I want to give you to wrap up the sermon. Philippians 4, 6 to 7, do not be anxious about anything. Really? Not even some things? I mean, give me something. Can I be anxious about some things? No. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding, all logic, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I think the thing that we've seen over and over and over again as we've looked at fear is the key to fear is relationship with Christ. 
It is our relationship in Him that should bring peace and should bring comfort. And in this final little scripture, the author is saying, listen, engage in that relationship. Be aware of His presence. Speak to Him. Pray to Him. Invite Him in. Cast your cares upon Him because He cares about you. Don't go through the things by yourself, but invite Him in. Come, let's stand, church.